This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More on them later. As we get closer to the maiden flight of Starship, we're dreading one thing. This thing has happened to nearly every super heavy lifter in history. I'm gonna venture to say it's one of the worst words in the English language. You'll get dirty looks if you say it out loud. So bad, it's sometimes even just known as the S word. That word, scrub. If history shows us anything, it's better to be safe than sorry. So how do aborts on other vehicles change the way SpaceX will launch Super Heavy? Stick around to find out. When we say Super Heavy Lifter, we're talking about any US rocket that can carry at least 50 metric tons to orbit or 100 metric tons for Russian launchers. So let's start with the US's first ever heavy lifter, the Saturn V. The first flight of the rocket, uncrewed, was scheduled for 1965, but you know that never holds true. Maybe we could call that Von Braun time instead of Elon time? The new realistic date was early 1967. However, during a test ahead of the Apollo 1 launch, a fire broke out in the capsule, which was atop a Saturn 1B rocket. During the test, a spark formed in the 100% pure oxygen environment. It unfortunately burned quickly and took the lives of Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. That anomaly caused program managers to look deeper into both the capsule and the upcoming Saturn V rocket. It turns out they found more than 1,200 problems. Jumping ahead to October, they started having problems with the onboard computers, which meant more delays. Apollo 4 finally launched in November of 1967. The vehicle itself had smooth sailing until a certain mission. Apollo 12. What, not the one you were thinking of? 35 seconds into the flight of Apollo 12, the rocket was struck by lightning that was generated as it zoomed through the clouds, knocking out the fuel cells, and a second strike 20 seconds later scrambled all the onboard data for mission controllers. They were close to aborting the launch, mid-flight, pulling the crew away using the launch escape system, but then a man by the name of John Aaron made a famous call. Hey Tom, what do you see? Body comes out, SCE dog. Say again, SCE dog. Oh. SCE to Ox. I'm sorry, Mike. SCE to Ox, Capcom. Apollo 12, Houston, try SCE to Auxiliary, over. NCE to Auxiliary. S-C-E, S-C-E to Auxiliary. You may recognize that call from our intro actually on live streams, but that obscure switch converted the signals into something Mission Control could read. They saw the rocket was flying right on target and gave the go to continue the mission. During this time, a new heavy lifter was being developed that was so big it needed 30 engines. Sound familiar? No, it isn't Starship, it's the N-1. During this same era, the Soviets were trying to beat the US to the moon. They decided that they were going to go with something massive. The N1 ended up with a whopping success rate of 0%. Even before its first flight, it dealt with cracks in an oxidizer tank, something we've also seen during testing in Starbase. During the first flight in February of 1969, the launch was going well until pieces of metal got lodged in one of the engine turbines, causing too much engine movement, ripping parts of the rocket, leaking propellant, and ending in an earth-shattering kaboom. Another test blew up only a few seconds after launch when an oxidizer pump ingested some slag, destroying the engine, and all engines shut down as a result, and the pad became a ball of fire. The last one came so close to orbit, but then an oxidizer pump, again, exploded, causing the range safety officer on the ground to hit the destruct button. Russia gave up on that rocket, and instead focused on their next heavy lifter, Energia. It had a central core tank, kind of like the space shuttle, and four liquid boosters on the side, unlike the solids on the shuttle. But because of that design, all payloads would have to go on the side. The first test was to deliver the Polyus satellite into orbit. However, a computer software error caused the satellite to end up in the wrong orbit and eventually burnt up. It did fly successfully a second time. That flight famously carried the Soviet shuttle Buran on its only flight which didn't have crew on board. While the rocket only flew twice and worked once, we did get something out of it. The engines used were called RD-170s, and for the fellow space geeks out there, you may notice a pattern here. A two-chamber version was developed, which they called the RD-180, and those are still in use to this day aboard the Atlas V. 
rockets aren't the only heavy lifters we're talking about. One example, Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn about math and science topics, and it's all interactive. If you're interested in a career in aerospace or just want to understand the world around you a little better, Brilliant has you covered. Brilliant has thousands of lessons, including one related to this video. Now we keep talking about these rockets trying to get to orbit, but what exactly is an orbit? Brilliant has a great lesson on what it takes to get your craft into an orbit that won't have you crashing back to Earth or flinging into the sun. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash NASA spaceflight or click the link in the description below. The first 200 of you to sign up for Brilliant will get their annual premium subscription 20% off. Now, let's check out the next lifter on our list. All right, mark off your bingo cards. It's not technically considered a super heavy lifter, but I have to talk about the space shuttle. Not just because I love it, but its aborts could also be significant for Starship's flight. Especially since the shuttle, which has been called the most complex vehicle ever built, was notorious for scrubs. Lots and lots of scrubs. One person who worked on the shuttle program estimated that half of all shuttle launch attempts were scrubbed at some point. One option that shuttle had that Starship doesn't have, at least for now, is in-flight abort options. The shuttle could do a few things depending on when a problem happened. No matter what though, they'd have to wait until the solid rocket boosters ran out, about two minutes into flight. It could RTLS, and no, not like Falcon boosters, it would turn around and land back at the KSC runway. It could abort to specific landing sites overseas, mostly in Europe, called a transatlantic abort, and it could abort once around, meaning it would limp into space, orbit once, and then come right back for a landing. The only abort mode that was ever actually used during the 135 shuttle missions happened on STS-51F in 1985. The space shuttle Challenger lost an engine three minutes before reaching orbit. So the call was made to abort to orbit. With the help of their orbital maneuvering engines, the shuttle entered a lower than planned orbit where it went on to complete its mission. The most well-known and probably the most dangerous abort for the shuttle is called an RSLS abort. Basically, that's when the onboard computers call for an abort after the main end is ignited, which happens only six seconds before liftoff. This is something that has already happened when testing Starship and some of the lessons learned came from these shuttle aborts. The ground sequence uh, did declare an abort from the vehicle. That will conclude today's test flight activities. The first time it happened was on the maiden flight of Discovery, STS-41D, in 1984. The command to light the engines was given, and with three seconds to go, the onboard computer shut them down. One of the biggest lessons was that a fire was detected on the pad, but the deluge system didn't activate until the crew was getting out, leaving them soaked and, you know, worried about fire. Four other missions had the same type of abort. STS-51F, yes, the same one that aborted to orbit, also had a scrub after engine ignition previously. STS-55 and 51 both had them in 1993. Then the best orbiter, at least according to me, Endeavour, had the closest abort of the entire program, almost reaching T0 on STS-68 in 1994. The abort was triggered 1.9 seconds before ignition. Again, once those solids light, there's no aborting for two minutes. It was so close, the onboard computers had already switched to in-flight mode. These procedures and the lessons learned about what to do following the aborts have been used in future rockets, including Starship. Now, we see aborts at T-0.5 seconds, and even that close to taking off, they now know how to save the vehicle, and in some cases, try again the same day. Of course, we have to mention the big orange rocket, SLS. Unlike Starship, which uses methane and liquid oxygen, SLS used liquid hydrogen and LOX. LOX did cause one issue when temperatures weren't where they needed to be, and a vent valve became stuck. But if you've been following SLS, you know one of the main scrub culprits involved hydrogen. The leak was found in the tail service mask umbilical plate quick disconnect. Try saying that one five times fast. Putting that into English, it's a part of the mobile launcher at the bottom of the rocket that helps fuel it. That was during a third test. The fourth test, same problem. Jumping ahead to launch attempt one in August of 2022, and we saw hydrogen leak again. But they fixed that and kept counting down until one of the engines wasn't chilled properly. At least, that's what mission controllers were being told. Turns out it was just a faulty sensor. Jump ahead a few days to September, and you guessed it, hydrogen leak in the same quick disconnect. Thankfully, it finally took off in November of 2022. 
Bringing it back to Starship, like I said earlier, Starship is already using lessons learned from these past scrubs. Take some of the ship tests in Starbase. Remember SN8? That shut down its three Raptor engines only two seconds before liftoff back in December of 2020. Two ships later, SN10 had something similar, when an onboard computer saw the engines were actually producing too much thrust and shut them down just before T0. As of this video, Starship has yet to try and fly, only conducting different static fire tests, including a 31 engine test. Do you think Starship will launch on the first try, or will it deal with multiple scrubs? Also, did we miss any? Let us know in the comments down below. I'm Sawyer Rosenstein. Later, nerds.